Hello, my name is Mary Lynn, and I'm the Curator of Language and Cultural Vitality at the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. Um, I'm coming to you from snowy and cold uh, Maryland, and I'm in the traditional homelands of the Piscataway Indians and their brethren. And the uh, Washington DC is still the home of the Piscataway today. Today, I'd like to talk with you about a research project called Sustaining Minoritized Languages in Europe. This is the second time I've talked about this research project at ICLDC. This time I'm going to be talking about the impact that doing this research for the case studies had on the site communities. I'd like to talk a little bit about impact before we go on. Um, impact is what we intend and the lasting changes that are expected to result from program or research activities. Now we all know that some, uh, some impact is unintended, both good and bad, um, but we should at least be thinking about the intended impact that we have whenever we do research or whenever we engage in a language initiative. Impact may include improved conditions for language or language work, increased knowledge or capacity for language and language work, changes in the discourse and attitudes around language and language work, or actual policy changes. Community impact may be the same or different from the project or research goals. For example, the research for the SMILE project is about how re language revitalization programs and individuals in these programs sustain and grow but the impact that the research had on these programs and communities is outside of the original propo proposal, but very much part of the research itself. I think all of us will have research goals or project goals that may be different than the larger community impact that we have. I highly recommend reading The Continuum of Impact. It's from the group Animating Democracy, and I have um, put the website uh, on the slide for you to download that. Okay, let's talk about the SMILE research itself. Um, this SMILE is a four-year interdisciplinary research program. The program examined, as I said, minoritized language re revitalization initiatives in Europe in a systematic and diachronic manner. The goal was to produce roughly comparative case studies around the same set of 76 research questions. The SMILE project ended up having six research teams, and I've put them on here. I'm not going to read them all, but we had a, a, a spread across um, Europe, um, Irish, um, Occitan, Galician, um, Upper and Lower Sorbian, Greco and Greco, and North Frisian. The teams had um, 18 months. Um, well, first, there was at least two principal uh, researchers from, uh, from each area, and I've put those on this slide as well. The principal researchers included community practitioners and scholars and academic members, and they all formed a larger team that included community members and students to actually help them conduct the research. Each research team received an award of up to 120 US, 120,000 US dollars to conduct the research in 18 months. All the teams consulted together at, and with advisory board members for comparing and analyzing the results across the communities in three separate workshops. Well, all these languages share, all these communities share some common European social and political histories. They differ in their ongoing efforts in substantial ways, such as the size of the speech communities and therefore whether they were engaged in reclamation, revitalization, or maintenance, whether they had state or local initiatives or, uh, and support. Um, whether there were separate language communities, such as the islands um, and the mainlands for North Frisian or the Greco and Greco, which are separated by quite a few miles. <laughs> um, and also whether or not there was a single cohesive effort, such as in Cemente, where we looked at an actual organization, or whether it was uh, many different initiatives in a larger area, such as the Occitan in around Toulouse. 
But given these differences, the six case studies outline the communities or revitalization programs efforts at various stages of their life cycles. Yes, we were looking at them as living organisms and also looking at them long term. They all explore the connections between motivations and language revitalization and traditional cultural heritage and sustained and how those may sustain revitalization and maintenance strategies. And they also analyzed how language revitalization and maintenance programs and people respond to internal and external historical and current economic, political factors and, um, um, and economic factors. So adaptability, response, and growth. This last is the subject of an edited book stemming from the SMILE research um, and the case studies. For more information on each of these case studies and the principal researchers and the research questions, they are all available on the SMILE website, which I will give later. So it's not surprising it was a really talented group of people and 18 months and a lot of people working on these research questions that we had quite a bit of what would be traditional output or product from, from the research. And this gives you um, a, a taste of it. 23 publications, <laughs> 54 academic conferences and invited talks, three theses and dissertations, internships at the Smithsonian, um, and so on and so forth. Um, this would be really, it is really great, and it really um, uh, was uh, uh, inspirational to all of us, got a lot of information out there in scholarly ways. We um, had everybody at the end of their research provide us with a, um, a, a final report where we asked them on the act about the activities and accomplishments, what they felt that their main findings from the research questions were. Um, how many participants, teams, volunteers, any collaborating institutions. We asked them about the products and disseminations that you can see here. Um, and um, we had everybody put um, most of their interviews um, into the Dance uh, uh, Research Archive in the Netherlands. So we asked for a spreadsheet of that material and their final budget, of course. Okay. So I want to show you, um, this is one way of, of portraying those results, but I want to show you that we also, what this looks like in a standard bibliographic form. So we also created a report about this for ourselves and our funders. Um, this is what it looks like. And you can see, I'm not going to go through this for very long, but you can see the output is very, very nice. Here's the publications, here's the conference papers, DCs, website or digital formats, media coverage, uh, collaborators, um, which are quite a few when you have that many areas and that many um, institutions involved. Okay. So this report is also available on the website if you'd like to take a, a look at it. However, about halfway through the 18 months of the research, the Irish team had told us um, that the, um, the, the group that they were working with the, um, were interested in the research questions themselves um, and were looking at them for um, as as helping them with their own self-evaluation and planning. So for example, the research questions had included questions of authority, how authority is, is given or earned, um, how to incorporate, how do people incorporate new speakers? Um, how do you resolve issues of purism? And these are research questions, but the actual language workers, practitioners in Ireland, um, hadn't really thought about them in the way that researchers think about it. And they felt that it was important for them to actually stop and ask these questions of themselves. And this was rather surprising to us. And I felt that this was an impact that we hadn't really foreseen. So we ended up in the final report also asking the researchers a set of other questions. And here are the actual questions that we asked them to fill. We're not, I'm not going to read them exactly, but um, notice that there's not that many. <laughs> and we actually really restricted them to five page maximum. And um, the first part is the original question, hey, did you use this anyway to help um, planning or organization? The second question it also 
dealt with some other traditional impacts such as training and education. Uh, the second question is really um, almost all the principal researchers had a community meeting where they presented the results of their case study to the community. So we wanted to know what kind of impact those that discussion or the discourse around that had. And the third one was any if they thought if there's any really lasting effects in the community from doing the research. Um, even with five pages, there was a lot of data for me to sift through. I was really fortunate. I had an undergraduate intern from Carleton College, Sarah Stanky, who was um, only on a three week internship. And um, I had her help me go through it and see what she thought were the main areas out how it, the how the impact broke out. And together we came up with these four main areas of impact. So critical understanding that it really the actually doing the research, taking these interviews with the researchers. Um, and then using some of these questions themselves would help them assess their existing pro, uh, approaches, identifying needs and new directions how we could connect people with each other, um, and educational opportunities for community members, and then the more general public awareness and increased engagement in language or language work. So here are some of our, our findings from this. So the first one, um, the critical understanding, the first one was people using it actually for assessing. And as I mentioned, the first one, the um, Ida Corcogana uh, organization in Ireland really used the pro, uh, program, used the questions themselves to identify programs, strengths and gaps. The Occitan community, um, used uh, used a workshop, had a workshop where they took some of the questions to discuss areas for improving the scope of Occitan, Occitan language education. Galician parents in the Cemente school, this is a primary uh, 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 kind of a language nest and growing into primary school in Galician, um, use it to reflect on the dynamics of family language policy in their own community. And the upper and lower Sorbians discuss problems and ineffectiveness of their own language education programs as well. This then led to new findings about themselves, self-discovery, and new directions. Um, so for the Occitan, it was uh, uh, wanting to include more cultural and historical context into the language learning and need for new and improved social spaces outside of the classroom for Occitan. In that, in that area, most, things, most language work was in classroom situations. The Lower Sorbians also assessed a need for, uh, for space, especially for a safe space for new speakers to really practice and use their language. The Cemente uh, parents invited the SMILE team to hold an interactive workshop on dynamics. So the principal researchers were asked to come in and do something else besides what they, the original research. And based on the community research, the Irish uh, group uh, are planning um, initiatives focused on teens' use of Irish. Okay, the second one, connecting people and communities. We looked at three areas, and I'm not going to go into all of these in detail, but we looked at people connecting within their communities, and we definitely had um, a lot of results from, from that. The picture up there is from a North Frisian. Um, the North Frisians decided they really wanted to do a monster theme writing workshops for their youth. And uh, so that's what the picture of that, that a great publication came from that. Across, um, and one of the, across the communities. So um, the, one of the major, um, I would say impact here is the Greco and Greco language communities actually met together for the first time in, we don't know how long really for a long time. Um, and uh, that was um, a really great. And then also um, the Cemente um, group came to the Greco area to talk about their immer immersion preschool. Uh, the Lower Sorbians uh, and um, were also interested in the Cemente pr uh, project and the Greco uh, presentation um, on uh, how their youth got working together. So across the case studies, there was definitely a lot more um, communication and collaboration. 
And then beyond a lot of these groups, um, then we're starting to look at other language revitalization programs that they had never thought of looking at before. And the Galician and Lower Sorbian community members um, attended the, um, the, the large gathering in uh, British Columbia, um, Canada, the Let Languages Live. And I received an email just the other day of how that's still impacting the young, uh, young people who went to that in setting up new programs. The third out outcome was educational opportunities. There was a lot of training people in the communities to conduct interviews, to transcribe interviews, um, uh, and uh, to be part of the actual doing the research itself. Also more traditional educational opportunities in that an Occitans, two Occitan students and one North Frisian MA student um, uh, used a lot of the data from both language and uh, interview cultural data uh, to do their MA thesis. And also um, one of our principal uh, researchers is getting his PhD um, the, and from working in SMILE. And, um, and also, there's two Smithsonian interns. Uh, of the three th Smithsonian interns that I had, two were MA students of color. And as I said, Sarah, um, an undergraduate, came from a rural Midwestern farming community. This was definitely a new educational opportunity for her. The fourth is the uh, oh, public awareness. Um, and we could talk a lot about this, but you kind of can um, understand how by doing this and getting together and talking, the groups became, the larger than the language groups became aware of language issues, of what language programs were going on in the community, the communities, uh, the language workers feelings of need for what they needed support from the communities as well, in almost every single one of the six case study areas. We also published blogs from each one of the case studies on the Smithsonian Folk Life um, magazine. Um, and these also helped to add to prestige that they were being a focus, a focus of something on the, at the Smithsonian and on the Smithsonian website. The um, Irish one was even translated into Irish. Um, and um, so quite a nice thing that way. Okay, we can also say that um, research, scholarly re researchers and academia is a community as well. So looking at the impact of that community, um, this are, these are the numbers for um, the actual principal researchers for, for SMILE and also their immediate uh, most cohesive part of their team that were doing the transcriptions and this kind of stuff. So 74% were female participants, 68 students were involved, 68%, 67% female-led research teams, and 45% community members in, the, in, do, in actually doing the research itself. And this picture is a group of the principal researchers and most of our um, uh, advisory board. Okay, so um, the SMILE impact report is up on the website and um, it's very beautiful. This, this um, I can show it to you, this, um, the, I, I'll get to it. This is a SMILE website, a second. Here it is. Uh, this PowerPoint presentation is actually our, our draft. And uh, what we thought was pretty good, Ann Peterson and me, she was the program manager for this. And she also works in impact evaluation now for the whole Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. Um, so we thought that we had done a pretty good job. And then we gave it to um, our, we're lucky enough, uh, most places don't, but we are lucky enough to have a, a, a a person on staff that can make everything that we do look beautiful. And this is what she came up with. So you can see this really quickly. It's really what we just covered. There's the outline of each of the uh, geographic areas, the critical understanding, connecting people. So you can see what this looks like.
I understand that not everyone is really going to um, have <laughs> this kind of, of, of resources on hand, but you can do a lot in making um, uh, something, your output look really beautiful as well. So that's the last slide that we went to, and then this is the end of it. I will go back to, this is the, the uh, resource, if you want more resources on, on this, here, this is the, the um, SMILES website. And here are each one of the case studies here, the research questions, the output list, and that impact report are right there. Okay, to finish up. Yes, impacts are intended and lasting. There's always an unintended impact, um, but I am much more aware of in, and being aware and intentional about impact as I go forward in my own research, both planned and potential. Okay. Um, if lasting, we need a little bit more time to look, but I think that there's enough impact from the SMILE research in some of the communities that this will be lasting, um, not just the knowledge about it that we gleaned, but what happens in the communities. There's much overlap um, in those four criteria that we came, or the four areas that we came up with, um, overlap with uh, increased knowledge, capacity, capacity conditions. But I think I can say that most research teams have had some impact in knowledge and capacity and in changing the discourse, and in some cases, the attitudes more favorably for language revitalization or maintenance in their communities. Community impact may be the same or different from your research project, um, and we don't often get credit for these, what happens in the community. So that first list that I showed you of the products, we get credit for that, but we don't always get credit for anything else that happened in the community, um, for tenure, for funders, for our bosses. Unless and until we can show that there is this impact, we cannot hope to change the system in order uh, to get credit for this. And it's not just about us getting credit, but if there's a lot of work and that this needs to be shown for community practitioners to their bosses um, and in academia as we go up for tenure and promotion. I can tell you that our funder, uh, Faring Pharmaceuticals was very happy with the list but even more happy with the impact report. And in fact, has given more money to do impact evaluation work as well. So it, it does have some sway in this way. In fact, much of my work at the Smithsonian now is on how to gauge impact um, that community language work has um, beyond language acquisition um, in communities. So I'd like to thank you today for joining me and I am welcome to have questions.